All right. So um, I'm going to share a case that I actually did with Lewis Cohen um, almost exactly a year ago, actually. He's a 53-year-old gentleman. Um, he had a long history of poorly controlled HIV at the time that he actually came into the hospital, had a CD4 count of only 11, also had a history of COPD and was on chronic prednisone, um, 10 milligrams daily, high blood pressure, insulin-dependent diabetes, who presented to the ED actually for a COPD exacerbation, and then incidentally noted to have three weeks of very severe adenophasia. Um, notable in his history, he did have a history of oral thrush, and when he was examined by the um, Silver Medicine Service on um, this admission, was noted to again have oral thrush. And so rather than calling us, they actually just empirically began him on fluconazole for his oral thrush and adenophasia. We weren't consulted until six days later when the patient was having ongoing severe dynophagia and had not really improved very much um, despite being started on fluke. And he began requiring pre-meal Percocet to swallow anything, so very significant. Um, was already quite cachectic and um, had been begun to lose weight um, by day six of his inpatient stay. Um, I was not able to get my video actually to pop into my um, into my uh, PowerPoint this morning, but uh, you get the general idea. Um, this is actually what the um, upper part of his esophagus looked like. And you can see these sort of very um, punched out appearing ulcers. And then um, actually, as we got a bit lower down, there were just these very horrible looking confluent circumferential ulcers as well. And I'm bummed that you can't see the video because um, as we got through his esophagus slowly and gently, um, felt very proud of ourselves for what we thought was gonna end up being a slam dunk diagnosis um, in this very characteristic patient. And there right at the um, bottom of his esophagus was a nice big prednisone pill as well. <laughs> um, so um, interesting differential in this patient. Um, but I would like to just to turn our attention for a moment to um, infectious esophagitis, something that we talk about a lot, especially in the beginning of fellowship um, and always good to review. So um, I went and looked at the 2013 guidelines after we did this case to remind myself of how many bites we should be taking when we're trying to make an accurate diagnosis of infectious esophagitis, particularly in patients with um, concomitant HIV. And the guidelines are actually um, solely dependent on this one little study that was done in GIE um, from way back in 1996. Um, and uh, I thought it was sort of an interesting study design, so we'll talk about it a little bit. But basically there were 100 patients at Grady Memorial in Atlanta, the hospital associated with Emory, and all of these patients um, were noted to have HIV and a visible ulcer on endoscopic evaluation. Um, Basically what they did is um, the um, uh, study leaders um, took 10 biopsy bites from the base only of the quote unquote most accessible or largest ulcer, um, put three bites in one container with formal and three bites in another and four bites in the last one. And then also did brushings for candida on these um, patients who had come in with ulceration um, and HIV. Um, they also uh, underwent um, repeat endoscopic evaluation at the complete completion of whatever their therapy was, whether it was fluconazole for um, candidiasis um, or therapy for H HSV or CMV as well. Um, and this is how they made the diagnoses or confirmed the diagnoses. So um, they confirmed uh, with um, uh, histology, but um, they, they also did PCRs for CMV. Um, for Canada, they look for plaques um, and then also complete resolution of the ulcer and clinical resolution at the completion of 21 days of fluconazole. Um, and then in the very few patients for whom the etiology ended up being GERD, um, those patients were treated with a PPI and rescoped. Um, interestingly, the outcomes of this study um, were not related to um, the um, uh, accuracy of of diagnostic yield from biopsy, they were clinical outcomes. So primary outcome being um, clinical evidence of recurrence.
current bleeding after the first EGD, and then secondary patient requiring blood transfusions or requirement of a surgical intervention or 30-day all-cause mortality, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, and what you can see here is this is just sort of the um, demographics. Uh, 50 patients were found to have CMV, and then um, 35 patients were found to have an idiopathic esophageal ulcer. Um, for the patients who were noted to have CMV, however, um, which ended up being relevant in our patient, um, in 64% of the cases, all three biopsy groups were positive. Um, but you didn't actually need to have uh, pan positivity in all 10 bites. Um, you actually got pretty good yield even with fewer um, biopsies. HSV was a little bit more challenging. Um, they actually don't have a table for it. Um, but perhaps not surprising since they only ever biopsied from the center of the ulcer, which any first year GI fellow will proudly tell you isn't where you biopsy for um, diagnosis of HSV since <laughs> HSV lives in squamous cells and it's better to biopsy from the side of the ulcer rather than the center. Um, so this was just a nice little um, review included in this, in this paper um, of the characteristic findings. Um, which I thought was helpful. Um, but then going back to the guidelines. So the guidelines, again, predicated on this little study of 100 patients, recommends that you take between three and 10 biopsies if you're concerned about CMV. And then patients who um, don't necessarily have characteristic histopathologic findings, which is actually quite common in patients who have HIV, um, something I learned by reading this article. PCR is actually more sensitive, but it just doesn't help you distinguish between latent and active CMV, um, which can be problematic, especially in these patients who are profoundly immunosuppressed for whatever reason, whether it's HIV or um, you know, on chronic prednisone as this patient was as well. Again, HSV, you always want a biopsy at the ulcer margin rather than the center. Um, and then the recommendation um, for Canada is based on a small 2004 study that showed increased yield with brushing rather than biopsy um, for that diagnosis. Um, just an update on our patient. Patient ended up having concomitant CMV and HSV, and as I mentioned, had a pill stuck in his esophagus as well. So had pre pretty much the full gamut of um, things that can cause <laughs> ulceration in one's esophagus. And um, he actually did quite well with therapy and with improvement of his CD4 count once he was restarted on antiretroviral therapy. Great. Um, thank you. I, I may have missed it. Did that study review, I thought I saw bleeding. Was it adverse events related to biopsies? Did it, did it, um, did it uh, report that? Yeah, so, the, um, so very few patients had um, any adverse events. Two patients actually died over the 34 months that the study um, covered, but most likely that was because they had end-stage AIDS. All of these patients had CD4 counts that were impressively low, and I don't think any of the patients actually had any major adverse outcomes just from endoscopic intervention. So I think that's an important point to hammer home is that a lot of times when you know patients come in on service or you know are scoped at, at bedside, whatever, with these findings, we we shouldn't be afraid to take biopsies. I think in general there's a big fear that there's a risk of perforation um, or bleeding from these. But you know, I think that that paper hammers that point home that it's safe. You need to take biopsies in order to make this diagnosis. And as you pointed out. It's not necessarily the number of biopsies, it's, it's making sure you're getting the right distribution from the edge of the ulcer and from the, the base or the center of the ulcer. Um, any, any comments, anyone have any other thoughts? Chris, can I ask a question? Sure. When you biopsy, do you do 10 bites? It just seemed like a huge number, <laughs> but. So in, in general, I, I am the kind of person that my, my, my philosophy with biopsying is if it's really important, you should only be taking one bite with each pass of the biopsy forceps. Um, you know, I like to tell you guys when we're, when I'm doing fellows uh, uh, cases that, you know, when you take two bites with one pass of the biopsy forceps, you're going to lose that second piece, the first or second piece, 50% of the time. The biopsies we use are not really designed for multi-bite, but we all do it to save time but in some ways it may end up um, resulting in, in a longer procedure if you're losing pieces. 
So in general, when I have something that is important to biopsy, a cancer, a mass, something like this, I take at minimum four separate biopsies, often yeah. around five or six. Um, yeah, rarely do I take 10 biopsies for something, but even like Barrett's esophagus, I don't really stick by the four quadrant rule. I usually take circumferential biopsies around the GE junction. And that's just my philosophy with, with biopsying things in general. I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts. Jerry, what are your what are your thoughts on all this? I don't take uh, any more than four biopsies from uh, from just about anything. Mm -hmm. I think if you can target biopsies, <laughs> something big. If it's something big, I take it all out. <laughs> someone else trying to chime in here? We're getting some mixed feedback. And a plug for cytology, please. What's that? I said the cytology, let's not forget that. Cytology has a high yield, brushings. So it sounded like it was a high yield for Canada. What Canada. about what about the viral uh, etiology? HSV, HSV as well. That's interesting. We don't usually do that in uh, immunocompromised patients where we're looking for CMV or HSV. I don't think many of us do brushings. You think we should be doing that? Yes. I think the concern with brushing is that it, in many ways it can be even more uh, disruptive and cause more potential bleeding. It's just a, a little bit more of a vigorous intervention than, than biopsying, but um, no, it's something to consider. I mean, I think everything, we have to consider everything uh, on the table when we're, you know, diagnosing these patients. Uh, Ali presented a case, uh, she's presented the case multiple times that I share with her of a patient with a big esophageal ulcer who was immunosuppressed for a transplant and it turned out to be a lymphoma. And the initial round of biopsies were just sort of very small, one or two little biopsies. And she sent the patient to us for more, you know, EUS and more in-depth things. And at the end of the day, all, all we ended up doing was just taking more biopsies. And we, we got down into the, where the ulcer really was and the patient did fine. So, um, okay. Um, all right, well, very good. Thank you so much, Lauren, always good things to learn from these cases. Uh, we will hand it over to Steph. All righty, can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Perfect, okay. So I'm gonna present a case that I um, actually scoped with Nikhil about a year ago as well, and it's entitled In One End and Out the Other. So this is an 81 year old gentleman. He has a history of mild cognitive impairments some hypertension, hyperlipidemia. He carried a history of diverticulosis and this history of chronic diarrhea. He presented to the hospital basically with acute on chronic worsening of this diarrhea. So he says, he tells us that he's had the diarrhea for over four years and he's been on Imodium for most of this time. He had had an extensive outpatient workup and it was thought to be secondary to overflow because he had a large stool burden seen on imaging he was managed on laxatives, which he told us did nothing for the frequency or the consistency of the stools. He'd had a colonoscopy seven years ago at an outside hospital with severe diverticulosis in the sigmoid colon and no other findings. He told us the stools were pretty watery and that he was seeing undigested food and that he'd have the diarrhea within 30 to 45 minutes of every meal. There was no blood in the stool. In the few days prior to presentation, he said that the frequency had worsened. It was no longer having any response to Imodium. And so because of that, he decided to present to the ED. So on arrival to the ED, he was tachycardic, but otherwise vitals were stable. He had a mild AKI and a K in like the 2.8, 2.9 range. He got a CT scan done in the ED before we were called and it showed a massive stool burden throughout the colon with distended loops of small bowel and fecalization. And the CT also noted mild wall thickening or an irregular nature of the third portion of the duodenum, which they noted was adjacent to the sigmoid. He was admitted to medicine and basically treated for overflow diarrhea with a strong bowel regimen, both orally and rectally. Unfortunately, the diarrhea didn't really improve. He got a repeat abdominal x-ray that showed a reduction in the stool burden and improvement in the small bowel dilation. However, he was still having like multiple episodes of watery stools right after he ate. 
So given this, they got a repeat CAT scan, which just again noted this abnormal wall thickening in the third portion of the duodenum adjacent to the sigmoid colon. And on this CT scan, they wrote concerning for possible fistula tract. So given that, we scheduled him for a push enteroscopy. Show you what we found. Do you have a do you have an image of the third portion of the duodenum next to the sigmoid by any chance? I did not take a screenshot of it. I should have. I'm so sorry, but I that is an that. impressive finding. So if you can share that at some point, yes, absolutely. Or I can also give you his MRN, and we can always. But I'll show you what we found. So this was in the duodenum. About to get in. Sorry about the crap. Expected to find nothing. Kind of in duodenum here, we kind of pull back for a second, and there is a very obvious fistula tract with mucoid and almost what looks like stool coming up. And we were able to, we swapped out the pediatric colonoscope, went back in with a gastroscope, we were able to reach it. And we were actually able to get through this fistula tract into the colon. And you could hear our insufflation coming through his rectum when we were in the mouth, which is great. These are just some pictures of what we saw and of this fistula tract. So we took biopsies from the fistula tract and I only mention it because it's, it was kind of crazy. So we got duodenal and colonic mucosa from the same uh, biopsy. So he actually underwent a diagnostic laparotomy. He had a takedown of this fistula and a low anterior resection with a primary anastomosis. Um, and di the diarrhea completely resolved after the surgery and he was discharged home off of Imodium with no complications. So I thought I'd briefly talk about fistulous complications after diverticulitis because this was certainly not a high on the differential when the patient came into the hospital. I actually found very little and we'll talk about it, but I will talk about this coloenteric fistula um, case that I found. So about 25% of, of patients with acute diverticulitis have some sort of complication. So that's either a perforation, an abscess, a phlegmon, a stricture, or a fistula. But interestingly, fistulas only comprise about two to 4% of the complications, so it is more rare. I found numerous articles describing fistulas in the setting of diverticulitis. However, almost all of them were to the bladder. Um, about 60% of fistulas are considered colovesical, 30% are colovaginal, and only 3% are coloenteric. Of note, there are colocutaneous fistulas that can happen, but these often occur after resection and were considered more of a post-surgical complication as opposed to a diverticulitis complication. So there's no data on the best management. I was kind of hoping we could actually talk about it. Surgical management obviously involves taking down the tract, drainage of any collection, and if severe diverticular disease, you can always do a resection. My question here was, we, he ended up going to the OR, but is this somebody who we could have considered either suturing or a bare claw clip to try to close that tract? Um, I'm not sure I remember why we didn't. Surgery had already been involved from the first CAT scan because of the questionable small bowel dilation. And so he ended up going to the OR. So just why well, we can just go back for a second and just ask, I don't know, if, is this something that would be amenable to endoscopic suturing or a clip, or is there a reason why we usually let these patients go to the operating room? Keel, you want to comment? Uh, yeah, I, I do remember um, this case because uh, the patient had actually presented, if I remember, the week before with similar yeah. complaints, and the, the GI consult team at that time you know, was thinking that it might be like overflow diarrhea, um, and the patient wasn't scoped. And then when we took over, you know, we, we said, let's take a look and see, um, you know, to investigate the findings on the CT scan. Um, with respect to your, I also remember this case because you probably said, oh, cool, about 20 <laughs> times during, so cool. <laughs> during, uh, during the procedure. But with respect to your question about um, endoscopic closure, so the data is not um, great because a lot of this comes from retrospective case reports and case series. But um, we published about seven, six or seven years ago on endoscopic suturing um, for a variety of different um, indications, including perforations, leaks, and fistulas. And suturing works really good for acute iatrogenic perforations. Um, 
typically on the order of about 90, 95% or so. Um, the limitations uh, would be the location. Um, if you're in a very tight working space, like the esophagus, for example, or in an area where you're working in a retroflex position, like the fundus, then suturing can be challenging. But for perforations, it works really well. For leaks, it actually works pretty well also if the leak is identified um, more acutely. But with fistulas, what ends up happening is, um, particularly chronic fistulas, the surrounding tissue is just not very healthy. And then you form this, um, you know, th this fistula tract, which ends up being very, very difficult um, to perform any endoscopic therapy on. So for suturing, our data found that with fistulas, it only works about 50, 60% of the time. Um, and then with Ovesco clipping, you're very limited by the size of the defect. So the clips, um, as you know, the Ovescope's clips, um, they're mounted onto the outside of a cap, which is affixed to the tip of your endoscope. And so you're really only limited by how much of that defect you can get up within the cap to deploy the clip. So in this case, it was a very um, well-formed track. There was a lot of unhealthy tissue in the area. Um, and whenever we're doing closure, you want to make sure that there's viable surrounding healthy tissue so that you can have a durable um, closure and apposition. So, you know, right away when we saw this, um, I entertained the idea of endoscopic closure, but ultimately felt that it was just going to be kicking the can down the road. And this patient really needed a, um, you know, a definitive therapy, which was um, appropriately surgery in this case. It was a really cool case. And it was even cooler that we got the biopsies that came back with both. <laughs> from our upper scope. Yeah. Awesome. Did he have a, did he have a colonoscopy at some point? Not, uh, not from us during this hospitalization, but he was scheduled to CGI after, and then he had had one seven years prior with an outside hospital gastroenterologist. I mean, you, you think about other etiologies on the differential things like IBD or, um, cancer, um, can all do this where there's erosion, infiltration, and fistulization. So um, it, at some point, it would have been prudent for him to have a, a colonoscopy or even pre-op. But I guess the, you know, he needed surgery, as, as everyone said. I don't think there's any debate there. And uh, uh, very interesting case, very interesting case. Had, had he had a history? I, I don't, I, I missed it. He had a history of diverticulosis. Did he have a history of diverticulitis in the past? Nothing that we were told, we didn't know if it was just a missed episode at home that he kind of worked through himself, but nothing that we knew about. Um, I will say that there was concern about prepping him preoperatively. He had a large school burden still on the CT, and I think that's because we were bypassing kind of duodenum to sigmoid. And so therefore, I'm not sure how much of the prep would have fully cleaned him out. I guess it would have cleaned out his sigmoid. But. And did he have oral contrast on any of his CAT scans? Because I think that would have just cinched the diagnosis pretty quickly. I will look, I don't He, he did have oral contrast on one of them, if I remember correctly. Um, there, he had this remote history of a co outside colonoscopy seven years prior, um, but it hadn't, there hadn't been one in the, in the near future. I think he was in his early eighties and had um, like cognitive impairment as well. So it, um, I think that the thought on the outpatient side and then also on the initial um, consult the week before we took over was that this was sort of constipation, overflow, diarrhea, you know, in an elderly patient. Um, so I think when we came on, we got a repeat CT scan with oral contrast and we could see this and that's why we also brought him um, to endoscopy to investigate this. Anyone have any other thoughts? Any of our surgeons here or P Peter raising his hand, Peter Rubin? Uh, did, did they have to resect uh, part of the duodenum or colon in the surgery? He got a partial sigmoid resection, but he did not get any duodenal resection that I'm aware of. I think Alex just took down the fistula and then resected the segmental colon, but I don't think there was a duodenal resection. In general, yeah, think... when you operate on these, you have to resect the colon because the colon is diseased. Uh, it's the same reason the clips and, and suturing doesn't work. If you separate the fistula and just close both sides, the colon side is going to leak because the colon side is diseased. So you have to resect the colon. The other side of these diverticular fistulas is normal, whether it's the bladder or the vagina. Uh, 
or mm -hmm. a, another loop of bowel, and those generally can be closed. Um, but Ra Randy, is that section of the colon like a scad? Is it like a segmental colitis associated with diverticular disease? Is the disease, the whole segment diseased? You have to treat it like a perforated diverticulitis, which is what it is. Um, and you have to do an appropriate diverticulitis operation. Um, in, in what Chris was talking about, in terms of previous symptoms of diverticulitis, it's very common that these patients don't have history of previous attacks of diverticulitis, whether it's a fistula to the bladder, uh, and they'll frequently present with urinary tract infections, um, or even a fistula to the vagina in women that uh, they'll present with fecal drainage from the vagina, but no history of diverticulitis. Um, in women, you have to remember that the fistula almost only occurs in women who've had a previous hysterectomy. Uh, if the uterus is there, it acts as a pretty thick barrier between the colon and the vagina and you don't get a fistula. It's only after a hysterectomy that you get fistulas to the vagina. Um, this is a little bit unusual because the, the third portion of the duodenum is a retroperitoneal structure. To be in continuity with the sigmoid is a little bit bizarre. Yeah. Uh, I'm not quite sure how that happens physiologically. Uh, but uh, I think doing the sigmoid resection and a closure of the duodenum is definitely the right thing to do. No, it's definitely a fantastic case. I mean, and you have to think about cancer. That that's really uh, that happens a lot. The other place that it happens is in previous gastrectomies for ulcer disease uh, at the gastrojejunostomy, like in a Billroth two, they get marginal ulcers which can perforate, and you can get a complex gastrojejunal colonic fistula. Uh, and you have to think about that when the patient who's had a previous gastrectomy presents with diarrhea. Randy, isn't, isn't the most typical, you know, patients with, I guess, more right-sided diverticular disease, they can present with things like liver abscesses? Mm, I mean, it can happen from, uh, but that's uh, just from uh, bacteremia and uh, Not from sepsis. direct uh, extension. Not very often. Very cool case. Any other last minute thoughts? Any other final thoughts? It was a very cool case. Yeah, really. Thank you, guys. All right, thanks. Uh, Nick, you are up. Hey, right, thank you. All right, Nick, let me stop sharing. I will steal the screen. I think right. I can. So As you do so well. <laughs> today, I'm going to present a case of an ear speaker. Uh, the patient is a 58 year old male, no past medical history, presenting with jaundice. Uh, he was noted on labs to have a uh, very high bilirubin, 11.5, high AST ALT, 197, 322, high ALKFAS. He had imaging that showed a mass in the right hepatic lobe and it was caught, resulting in biliary obstruction. So it was a little unclear on the CT exactly what was going on. There was clearly a mass in the right hepatic load and a mass at the hilum, unclear if it was like the same mass or a lymph node, we got an MRI. And what you can see on the left is a, a mass, which is the blue arrow and the gallbladder, which is the yellow arrow. And it's kind of involving the gallbladder. On the right, you see again, this mass gallbladder and then red arrow pointing to an obstruction at the biliary hilum. And you can see a dilated bile duct, in this light colored area right here, right above the mass. This is the MRCP sequence, which also reveals another interesting finding. So the blue arrow is the dilated intrahepatic bile ducts. They're very dramatically dilated. The green arrow is the bile duct and the yellow arrow is the pancreatic duct. And what you can see is the bile duct and the pancreatic duct come together and then there is a long common channel before they insert into the duodenum uh, consistent with abnormal pancreatic obiliary junction. We decided to perform, perform an EUS for tissue and also an ERCP for the biliary obstruction. So on the EUS, you can see 
a mass invading the gallbladder. And then in a different view, it's hard to capture in both views, you can see the mass invading the liver. So essentially it's a gallbladder mass that invades the liver that's causing all of this. We took a fine needle biopsy and then proceeded to ERCP. This was another difficult cannulation. I didn't put a video of the cannulation, but it was very challenging requiring a precut sphincterotomy, but ultimately we did gain access. And the cholangiogram confirms what the MRCP showed. So again, in green, you can see the column blood duct and the yellow, you can see the pancreatic duct and you can see this is a cholangiogram. So we injected dye into the bile duct and the pancreatic duct is opacified. So that is diagnostic of abnormal pancreatic obiliary junction, essentially. They share a common channel. And that's why the contrast goes into both. And we'll talk a little more about that at the end. You can also see an abrupt cutoff of the bile duct near the red arrow where the biliary stricture is. So ultimately, as on the right, you can see we placed bilateral biliary stents to improve the biliary obstruction. So the patient improved, did very well with the biliary stents. All the LFTs came down. The fine needle biopsy of the gallbladder mass showed a poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma, which is a very rare type of gallbladder carcinoma. It's less than 3% of all gallbladder carcinomas. Um, and unfortunately it was very aggressive. The patient's plan for chemotherapy. But what I wanted to talk about more than the path is actually uh, APBJ because it's a pretty rare finding uh, and it does have some clinical consequences that are relevant for life and the boards. So I thought I'd mention those. Um, so it's a congenital malformation and the definition is when the bile duct and the pancreatic duct come together outside of the duodenal wall, resulting in a long common channel. And what you can see in these pictures is a schematic diagram, a normal insertion on the top is that the ducts come together within the duodenal wall and the sphincter of OD is intimately related to that junction, which prevents reflux of pancreatic secretions into the bile duct because there's a muscular barrier, essentially the sphincter preventing that from happening. On the lower picture, you can see an APBJ, which is a long common channel in the duodenal wall where the sphincter of OD is. And then there is the junction of the bile duct and the pancreatic duct outside of the duodenal wall, which allows for basically free communication between the pancreatic duct and the bile duct. And this results in uh, other consequences, including cancer, which we'll talk about. It's very rare finding and it's more common in Asian populations. And even in a Japanese cohort, it was 0.03% of ERCPs that they did, they found it. Um, it is more common in patients with biliary cysts. So there's an association between the APBJ and the biliary cysts. There's some question with certain types of cysts whether the APBJ might be related like a causative factor for the biliary cyst due to this pancreatic secretion uh, reflux. And then the other consequence is gallbladder cancer. And this is the main takeaway point because this is what our patient had. The rates of gallbladder cancer in these patients is very high. Uh, in studies, you can see here between 13 and 33%. And so any patient with this finding should have a prophylactic cholecystectomy. Our patient's a little interesting in that it wasn't a typical gallbladder carcinoma. It was a neuroendocrine carcinoma. There are case reports of neuroendocrine carcinoma with APBJ and the pathophysiology is the same, but essentially there is reflux of the pancreatic secretions, it gets in the gallbladder, causes inflammation, and then it's the same cancer pathway that we're used to of chronic inflammation leading to cancer. And they can have cancer in the absence of gallstones, which is the other main uh, traditional inflammatory cause that leads to cancer. So I just wanted to have uh, show that main takeaway point and I'll take any questions. First of all, beautiful, beautiful imaging, both the MRCP and the cholangiogram and even the, the uh, I think that's some of the nicest illustrations I've ever seen on this. So, oh yeah, those were good. I'm sure it took a long time to find because I, trust me, I've been through this before. But, <laughs> um, no, they're, they're beautiful pictures and I think it really hammers the point home uh, before we open it up for other questions, 
had you come across any uh, data regarding its role or incidence in patients with unexplained pancreatitis? Oh, interesting. Because also there's probably a, I'll decide, despite also like in addition to the pancreatic secretions going up the bile ducts, potentially the you know bile duct going into the pancreas or gallstones getting stuck and causing pancreatitis. Uh, I don't know. I didn't look specifically at that because I was looking at the cancer question. So I don't know what the rates are. Yeah, it can, it can work both ways. And it's probably not so much bile being toxic to the pancreatic tree, but probably more easier reflux of sludge or stones. Sure. Um, and just the lower threshold for the whole system to become obstructed. But usually if these patients have recurrent acute pancreatitis, you can often manage that with a um, with a biliary sphincterotomy or a sphincterotomy of the common channel. But as you point out, regardless um, whether they have pancreatitis or not, the gallbladder, it's recommended that the gallbladder should come out for this reason. And this isn't the first case we've unfortunately seen, but uh, very, very unusual finding, very rare finding, nice pickup uh, by you guys. Any, any thoughts or questions from the group? I would just give a plug. Um, if I'm I think this was my case, um, yeah. and, and I, if I'm not mistaken, this was actually missed by the radiologists. They got caught up in the, the gallbladder mass. <laughs> um, you know, it, we always, you always hear our group mention that it, the importance of looking at imaging, um, you know, not just for advanced, but to be around the general GI service. And we saw this, you know, fairly quickly in putting his whole case together um, on the MRCP images. Um, you know, and as Nick very eloquently stated, it's, um, um, and Chris did that, you know, you get this reflux of pancreatic juices freely into the biliary tree and the gallbladder basically just acts kind of like a reservoir. And so because of prolonged exposure and chronic inflammation, the, the internal lining of the epithelium can, you know, develop metaplasia and then subsequently dysplasia. So I've never seen it with this particular um, specific gallbladder cancer and neuroendocrine tumor. I don't know if, if Noam has any comment on that. I think traditionally we tend to see more adenocarcinoma. So I thought that was a little bit unique to this particular case. Yeah, I, I've never encountered this before. So that means it's probably the first time it's ever happened. <laughs> <laughs> I, I saw a patient many years ago who I think presented with recurrent pancreatitis, mm -hmm. was found to have an APBJ and she was taken care of down in North Carolina at, at an academic medical center. And they performed a Whipple resection on her, which I thought was a pretty extreme, uh, pretty extreme intervention. Um, I don't know if Nick, you came across that in your readings. Well, I guess there might be two reasons you could think about doing that, but I agree it's a very aggressive uh, approach, but the pancreatitis is one if the person, but the other one is that their incidence of all bile duct cancers is actually increased. Yeah. It's not just gallbladder carcinoma. So theoretically, if you resect that whole area, I suppose that reduces that risk, but it's not high enough. It's like 5%. It's not high enough to justify, I don't think, a prophylactic surgery. And, but. and anything more you can tell us about, you had, you had briefly touched on cholidocal cysts and its association with this. Any because uh, because we know certain as you mentioned certain cholidocal cysts, which are thought to be congenital, um, are also associated with an increased risk of cancer, bile duct cancer. Any any further thoughts on that? So a lot of the studies looked at patients with cholidocal cysts um, and APPJ, or patients with APPJ and no cholidocal cyst, and interestingly although we think of an association with bile duct cancer and gallbladder carcinoma with cholidocal cysts, there's actually a higher incidence of bile duct cancer or uh, gallbladder carcinoma with APVJ alone without cholidocal cysts. So it's still a very rare finding, but it's definitely something that we should all be aware of. At the very least, it's one of the coolest acronyms we have. It is pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> Any final thoughts uh, from the group? Very cool case. Very good cases today. You guys see this? Um, do you see this incidentally a lot when you're doing, you know, ERCPs for other reasons, or it's pretty rare, right? It's a very rare finding. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I've seen it once incidentally, 
um, it's, it's pretty uncommon. But to Nikhil's point, it's, it's something that ideally the radiologist should pick up on because right. as, as has been shown, there are clinical consequences to this. And, you know, sometimes if, sometimes it may be a situation where the surgeons aren't too familiar, you know, the surgeon may not be too familiar with this entity or the consequence. And then trying to convince a patient who's asymptomatic uh, to say, you need your gallbladder out and I say, why? I don't have any gallstones. I have no history of biliary colic, et cetera. Why am I going, undergoing surgery? So it, it, it leads to a lot of those, you know, difficult conversations. Um, and you end up having to convince multiple teams of people, surgeons, patients, et cetera, that there is a, there is a um, uh, intervention that needs to be done. So always a challenge. So after you take out the gallbladder, how do you, is there a role for surveillance of the rest of the bile duct? cancers in these patients? There is no recommendation. <laughs> it's too rare. Uh, it's reasonable. I'm not sure how you would survey it. Um, yeah. It's, it's tr just a tricky situation. I mean, this is a black box as far as what to do with cholidocal or biliary cysts because certain ones, uh, particularly type one and type two, um, particularly type one, do have an associated increased risk of biliary cancer. It's been debated, and I've seen many excellent lectures on the topic, but I, there's no guidelines on what to do. I've seen some folks put patients through surveillance endoscopies and cholangioscopy on a yearly basis with, with random biopsies, which seems very extreme. Uh, you know, and if you're doing imaging surveillance, there's really no precancerous thing you're going to find. You're, at best, you're going to find an early cancer. Um, so these are great questions. Fortunately, these are not common problems, uh, and it's not like there's a big epidemic of them. But you know, typically it would be annual, you know, annual scans. Maybe a CA99. Maybe you would do what you would do for a PSC patient. But um, I would think the yield is pretty low uh, and you know, the expense and the anxiety associated with all this is pretty high. So the best recommendation would be not to have this condition. <laughs> <laughs> not to be born this way. <laughs> and it goes for anything, Chris. <laughs>